See what I sound? Sound? Is that, ooh. Ooh, yes. Come on, people, don't be shy. Create a fire hazard. It's all good. Who here managed to get their lunch in? Yes, and now you have all come into this theatre on those nice, comfortable chairs, ready for a nice little sleep. Well, I'm afraid you came to the wrong room and the wrong speaker to do that. So, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's uh, Martin Verberg. Uh, some of you who've been to DevOx before may have seen me give some diabolical presentations in the past. Uh, I promise you that this presentation will probably have some swearing in it. I apologize in advance. Is there anybody under the age of 16? No, we're probably good then. Um, and as I've increasingly become sadly less of a developer and more of a sort of CTO or a CEO in things, someone's waving at the back, yes, hello, autographs afterwards. Um, I sort of started thinking more about all of the teams I've worked with and the teams I've seen and what makes good ones and what makes bad ones. Um, so I've seen, seen bits and pieces of both. So there's some boring stuff about me. Um, the one thing I would like to just mention briefly is that there's a talk here before by Heather and Patrick. Have to be on slides. Put slides on yes, no slides. Take that. This is, and no sound either. This is truly a diabolical talk. Uh, do, 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 do. do I have slides now? Nope. So for those of you who remember me speaking here last year where they actually switched off the movie projector, <laughs> they will try year after year to stop me from talking, but no, I will persevere. Right, so boring crap about me. Um, the most important thing about this slide is the Adopt a JSR and Adopt Open JDK program that I help run. Um, the world of Java is changing very rapidly. Um, things like lambdas are coming into Java 8. And a lot of these features have been guided by workshops with day-to-day -day developers like you and I. Well, I say you, uh, my team will tell you that the only code I'm allowed to commit is uh, comments or emails these days. Um, <laughs> I managed to commit one, a one-character change last week to a shell script. Awesome, still got it, yeah. So I'm gonna talk about the habits of highly effective teams. Uh, here is an example of a very, very effective team. Does anyone remember these guys? Who here still owns the DVD box set? <laughs> Come on, don't be shy. We're all geeks here. All right, so these guys, you know, pretty much won every episode they were in. That's how good they were. Um, and they showed sort of some of these characteristics, some of these habits. Um, they certainly had a lot of social interaction, ate a lot of pizza. Uh, they certainly had a common goal, beat the bad guy within 25 minutes, or the five-year-olds watching you will get bored and go away and do something else. Uh, they had very high levels of debate, they were always fighting uh, with each other, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to cover them off, all off, one by one. Uh, by about number seven, half of you will probably have fallen asleep, but that's okay. Um, there's a little known fact that for long conference talks like this, you know, the sort of around the 15 minute mark, 55 minute mark, that people will only ever take away one, two, maybe at the most three points. I have ten for you. So you get to pick and choose. It's like open source, a la carte open source, which I'll be talking about a little bit later on today. So the first effective habit of Teams is that social interactions are at the fore. And I'm gonna try running a little experiment with all of you here in the audience, because you've all had your food and you're all sitting there quietly. I'm gonna play a little game. Now software development is actually more of a social activity than it is a technical activity. And anyone who tells you otherwise is just dead, dead wrong or is working for a very ineffective team. We are very, very tribal creatures. 
Okay, you see children playing in the playground? They're not playing. They're mainly fighting. Okay, we all live in countries and cities and towns and suburbs. We all follow certain sports teams. So I would like everyone on this side of the room to please stand up. Go on, stand up. Don't be shy. Stand up. Here we go. I want you to all as yell as loudly as you can for two seconds. One, two, three, go! <laughs> Perfect. Sit down. Now, come on, guys. Those people on the right-hand side, that was a bit weak, wasn't it? Can we do better on the left-hand side? Has the left-hand side tried better? Go on, let's stand up and find out. Two-second yell. Three, two, one, go. Yeah! Brilliant. You see? That little bit of human competitiveness <laughs> shows exactly how tribal we are. You were probably all friends before, and instantly they wanted to beat you. Fantastic. So if you get this wrong in your team, if you have a lot of that clashing instead of a togetherness, you're going to have a team which doesn't work very well at all. So you get that finger pointing, especially when there's a production problem, like our uh, company has today actually behind the scenes. I'm here speaking on stage. My engineers are busy slaving away fixing problems. Yes. Be a CEO, people. It's, it's lots of fun. And uh, there's a buzz about certain social groups. You know, certain bands that you see, or uh, if you walk into a party, there's always that cool group in the corner who just has that sort of vibe about them. That's what you want your team to have. So here are some sort of practical tips, bits and pieces you can do to uh, ensure that your team does have these high level of social interactions. Number one, no matter how distributed your team is, make sure that there's instantaneous communication available. Now with technology like Google Plus Hangouts, WebEx, IRC channels, so on and so forth, there really is no longer any excuse not to be in constant contact with everybody in the team. The best setup I ever saw was a, a wall screen similar to this, which was a window into the remote office, and they had one the other way around. And the fascinating thing to watch was after about a week of working in this environment, both teams were starting to shoot Nerf guns at each other and hitting the wall because they just kind of forgot that there was this actual artificial barrier there. So I highly recommend that if you work for an investment bank and have lots of money, definitely splash out on one of those. They're fantastic. Um, we also try to make sure that we don't have them and us in highly effective teams. So uh, the Agile methodology speaks about this a lot. A lot. Don't split off your business analysts from your testers, from your developers, right? Because that just creates a, I'm going to throw my code over the wall to the testers who will end up throwing it back and we will hate each other. Or we'll throw it to the operations team who will tell you to get that nasty, stinking Java off my nice, clean Linux server. Please recode in Python. So a couple of examples of this I've seen out in the, in the real world, as it were. Does anyone here follow the Linux kernel mailing list? Linus Torvaldus? No? Wow. Are you guys all, do you guys all run on Microsoft Windows? As Microsoft as a premium sponsor seeded this entire audience with Microsoft developers. I'm, I'm getting a little bit concerned about DevOps. Where's Stefan? I'd like to register a complaint. So anyway, so there's a, there's a very famous thread in the Linux kernel mailing list where a developer, a very smart guy, has sat in his basement for about half a year, I think, and, com and wrote a completely new implementation for the scheduler for Linux. So how the operating system decides to uh, assign CPU time to different processes. And technically speaking, his solution was probably the best that Linux has ever seen. And Linus, who's sort of the, the chief architect of Linux or benevolent dictator, whatever you want to call him, he tore this guy to pieces. He said, how very dare you go away and hide this from the entire community for a year and try and dump, on a, dump it on us as a one massive code blob. I'm not going to accept this. I'm never going to accept this. Start from scratch. Start with the community. And this is coming from a guy who is known for his sometimes uh, anti-community sentiment. But on the flip side, you've got this case where this guy has sat there for, again, a whole, a whole year and written a really good technology solution, waste of time, because he thought that technology was more important than the social interactions. That's a key takeaway point. 
Um, tiger teams, for those who haven't heard of the terminology, is something that the investment banks in particular have. If there's a production problem, they'll grab a developer, an ops person, a tester, a business analyst, a trader, throw them all together in a room and force them to communicate in real time, face to face, until the problem is damn well solved. It's very, very, very effective. It, it's incredibly impressive to watch when you see them uh, in action. Next, highly effective habits, strong leadership. Uh, does anybody know who this guy is? Richie McCaw. Are there any Australians in the room or South Africans? None. This is being recorded on parlays, so I'd just like to say for all the South Africans and Australians out there, that's right, we are still the world champions. <laughs> Sorry for that slight insolute. Uh, but one of the key characteristics of the All Blacks, which is a New Zealand rugby team, they play a, a very highly intense elite international sport, is that they have strong leadership throughout, right from the captain here, Richie McCaw, all the way through to their 15 players. If, if you ever watch them on TV and you listen to the commentators, they'll, they'll constantly go on about this. Other people say leadership is defined like this. Uh, it's one of my, my personally... Uh, Favourite quotes, a friend of mine in the army who is uh, perhaps not the politest of people, um, whenever he gets impatient, this is exactly what he says. So he, d he actually demands and expects leadership from everybody around him. So with leadership, a lot of people, they get it confused. Right? People think leadership is management. It's not. People think that leadership is perhaps mentorship. Again, it's not. You don't have to be a manager to be a leader. Okay. Even if you're in a team of two, you can both be leaders. You can both be leading an aspect of the piece of work you're doing. And you don't have to have it that someone is telling you what to do from way on high. Another interesting aspect that I've seen in leadership recently, and the guys from Google uh, do a very good talk on this, is the idea of servant leadership. Where leaders have risen from a position of serving the team and almost reluctantly get put into a position of greater responsibility. But the way they lead their teams is to simply be servants. They will do anything and everything to help make their teams more effective. They will mop the floors. They will make the coffee. They will fill in the entire team's timesheets if that is what it takes to get their team moving more quickly. That's the type of leadership you want across the team. You don't want this guy. Who has this guy in their team or in their company? Yes, can we turn the camera around to the audience so we can identify all these people and report them? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, how am I going for time? Ah, oh, not too bad. Right, so the next, next aspect, which is a little bit related to this idea of um, leadership, is kind of the empowerment versus control um, dichotomy. I get to say an academic word, love that. The problem that I used to find when I first graduated in sort of the mid to late 90s, I won't say exactly how old I am, that's why I wear the hat, hides the grey hair, <laughs> very helpful, is that when I went through business school and, and did, did some management papers and things, it was all about corporate hierarchies. And the taller your hierarchy was and the more subdivisions you had, the better sort of American corporation you would be. Doesn't work in today's world. It simply does not work in the world of technology because technology and consumerism and things like the internet just moves business along far, far too quickly. So these sort of large, rigid structures where there's a lot of control um, leads to very, very ineffective teams. You know, when, when, you, when I work with teams and they say, oh yeah, we have a, a, a release cycle of two years or our product mo roadmap is 10 years, I just shake my head and say, well, I look forward to seeing your CV on my small company's desk in about six months when your company collapses. Have people here heard of the Peter promotion principle? Yes. So I recently got promoted to be the CEO of our small startup. <laughs> and when I gave this talk a couple of weeks ago at a very small conference in London to try it out, uh, my two engineers were sitting in the audience and just looking at me horrified as they realize that their CEO has been promoted to his level of incompetency. Um, you should, by the way, all still buy our products. It's, it's fine. I'm, I'm perfectly suited to know exactly what I'm doing. It's all good. So 
when you give people empowerment, when you give your teams empowerment, you enable them to make tactical decisions on their own. Okay? They don't have to go back to you as a manager or as a boss to make these types of decisions. For example, at J Clarity, we want to build a low impact, lightweight little demons that sit on people's servers, very, very quiet, until they get asked to perform some sort of performance analysis. I'm not going to tell my engineering team how to build that. I just want those principles in place. Right? So that's kind of a, a, a combined strategy we all share. How they implement it, their tactical decision making, completely up to them. And if I ever sort of step over that boundary and, and try and have my little say, they're very, very quick to, to stop me from doing that, which is a good thing. Swearing again. My lawyers keep telling me I can't spell these words out fully, but that's okay. Um, this has been my key philosophy for whenever I've run uh, highly effective teams. I just hire people who are smarter than me or who are better than me at their particular function, and then I just do everything to get out of their way. And it's really that simple. So if you're ever scared about becoming a team leader or a manager or a CTO or any sort of management responsibility or hiring responsibility, just follow this principle. Just hire people who are actually better than you at their job and get out of their way. You'd be surprised how quickly stuff gets done. So I won't talk about both stories here. I'll just talk about the first one. Um, my friend in the army, uh, when he was first on basic training, has anyone else here served in the army, in the military at all? Military intelligence, huh? Yeah, love that, love that term. <laughs> he served in military intelligence. He's, 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 in, he's, in, he's in trouble now. So my friend is uh, trekking through the jungles of uh, a little jungle area in, uh, off, the, off uh, the coast of Singapore, uh, where you send New Zealand soldiers to, to do their, their jungle training, basically. And in the military in those days, anyway, it's, it's a lot different now, there was very little empowerment for the lower level troops to make decisions, right? Everything was very highly controlled. The lieutenant tells the sergeant what to do, the sergeant tells the corporal what to do, the corporal tells the private what to do. They lost their lieutenant in the middle of their exercise. Just the team sort of took a right, lieutenant took a left, whoops, no more officer. Some would say they did this on purpose. Couldn't possibly comment. But then the team got lost themselves. And uh, my friend who uh, has done a lot of uh, hiking or tramping um, knows his way around the bush very well, very intuitive guy. Um, he suggested to his corporal, how about we follow this stream downstream? We'll hit some sort of coastline, we'll be all right, we can send a chopper in to go look for the lieutenant. And the corporal was like, hmm, I'm going to have to ask the sergeant. Goes and asks the sergeant. The sergeant goes, hmm, I can't really make that sort of tactical decision because I can't check with the lieutenant. Wait, let's roll back. <laughs> Where was the lieutenant again? Lost, exactly. So what did that platoon do for the rest of the day? They sat still <laughs> and got absolutely nowhere. So it's a, it's a practical day-to-day -day example, as it were, not an IT, but you can see it happening, where because there was too much control and not enough empowerment, an entire team just got stuck and did nothing. Now, thank goodness they weren't actually in a war zone, otherwise there probably would be no team left. Next habit of highly effective teams is a sense of shared goals. You all had a shared goal before, stand up and yell more loudly than those other losers on the other side of the theatre, which worked very well. This team won, by the way. And they're not going to let you forget about it because they're very tribal. They'll talk about it for the rest of the day. I bet you it's going to go off on Twitter at some point. So teams who are highly effective, they have these shared goals, uh, absolutely vital. And... I want you to sort of just think for five seconds now yourself. Do I and do my immediate team that I'm currently working with, do we actually have shared goals? Think about it for five seconds. I'm going to walk semi-silently across the stage here. Right, now, hands up everybody who's now just come to the realisation that their team actually does not have any shared goals. Good, right, that's your one big takeaway point for today. Go back to your teams after this and say, 
hey guys and girls, this really isn't working, we're all pulling in different directions, we're never going to succeed. And one of the major reasons is, is that everybody has this pyramid of needs, right? And these are kind of the individual goals that drive people. It usually starts with, I want a roof over my head, I want a piece of bread in the morning, and so on and so forth, until it starts to get to more aspirational goals. I want to be the next CTO of the next Twitter. Uh, I want to be a billionaire. Uh, I would like to have a turn on Larry's yacht, for example. But because everyone has these little private goals, a team can very easily shoot off in different directions. Right? You might have two developers who are secretly uh, wanting to stab the team leader in the back because they want his or her job. You might have the new intern who's in the same team who is just desperate to please everybody because she doesn't want to get fired because if she does, then she can't afford her rent the next week. So on and so forth. So you've got to make sure you come up with these guys. Shared goals. Your team has to be passionate about them. Okay. If the shared goal is, we're all going to convert to Maven, you might not have everyone be quite passionate about that. <laughs> uh, we use Maven, by the way. It's actually not that bad once you write your own plugins. Lots and lots of our own plugins. Come talk to me afterwards if you want to find out about how we built our own release plugin, which works. Scary. <laughs> yeah, it is scary. I know. Um, so the goals, they need to be uh, what we call smart goals. So I'll just go back a couple. This lovely little blackboard here. So they need to be specific goals. So not just some vague goal of, oh, we're going to take over the world. That's not going to do. Uh, they need to be attainable goals. Um, we can't expect, for example, a development team to rebuild Twitter in the space of one week. That's not attainable. And they need to be time-bound. And the reason why things need to be time-bound is because humans need to have a sense of closure. They need to have a sense of completeness. They need to have a sense of winning. It's amazing how satisfied people feel when they, when they think they've won at a goal or at a task. For me personally, I actually like going home and manually doing the dishes after a really stressful day at work. Because I might have lost all day at work, but damn it, I beat those dishes. <laughs> I clean them, they're stacked, and I've won, and I have a clean kitchen, and I love it. Right. So we shared goals. So a couple of quick stories again. There is a large tech firm, I won't name any names, who currently has tons and tons and tons of competing products within itself. Absolute madness. There are completely no shared goals within this company at all. And you can see it all spilling out into the public domain. Right? Projects get cancelled, other projects get favoured, some projects get open sourced, other projects get handed off to different communities, so on and so forth. And it just all looks like a big scattered mess. Right? There is no shared goals, different teams are going off in different directions, and the whole thing is just really, really ineffective. The Shoreditch Village Hall is something that was built recently in London. So I work for a co-working space called Shoreditch Works. And recently they wanted to put together a community hall where they could host events, small conferences like DevOps, well, a little bit smaller maybe. Um, and all these different individuals and different groups within our co-working space all had different private goals for this. Right? Someone wanted to start a cafe. Uh, someone wanted to have a free space to hold hack days. Uh, I wanted a different place to go clear my head and sit in a quiet room. However, we all had the one shared goal, and that was to get the money to get that space. So we ran a Kickstarter. And within three weeks, we, we raised 70,000 pounds, which I think is about, I don't know, 80,000 euros or so. And we met, went ahead and opened the space. And I still remember sitting in the meeting when we realized we'd raised these, these 70,000 euros in the space of three weeks, and we'd all worked so hard together. And I just realized I've been doing this with a complete group of strangers, and it was so successful. And that's what got me really thinking, that you don't necessarily even have to have a tight-knit team if you have shared goals to begin with. You can actually achieve an amazing amount of stuff. Next one. Who can tell me... What scene this is playing? Yes. 
Shakespeare's. Yeah, good old Brutus there. I love the look in his eyes as well. He really wants to stick that knife in, doesn't he? Does that remind you of some internal corporate politics, perhaps? So respect and trust is a very uh, unusual thing. It's very hard to measure. It's very hard to quantify. Uh, a lot of people talk about it, but they don't really know what they mean about it. And they don't often have practical steps of how to increase respect and how to make sure that everybody has trust. So I quite like this quote. I found this randomly uh, on a street in London, just scribbled in as a piece of graffiti. I actually regret not having the photo here of it. Um, but it's, it's very interesting. And the thing I like about it is it's a very unassuming force. So again, it's very hard to quantify. It's very difficult to, to put into exact concrete things. It's just this feeling almost. So here are some questions that you and your team should ask themselves right now. Do you have access to production boxes, or is there only a special elite trusted team that has access to production boxes? No, quite seriously. How many of you are not allowed to touch production? Wow. Your company does not trust you. <laughs> your colleagues do not trust you. And I've now sown some seeds of doubt into about 50 companies here in Belgium, probably. Fantastic. Um, I probably won't get invited back. That's okay. And the problem is, is that when people aren't given a basic level of respect and trust, is that they start to misbehave. And you'll see this quite often in uh, the penal system or the justice system. Um, I used to work sometimes as a guidance counsellor for troubled uh, teenagers uh, when I was younger myself. And the reason they used to say why they did the bad thing, and it always came out to, I don't get any respect. I don't get any respect from my peers, my parents, or from society. They use slightly different street language, but you, you, get, you get my point. <laughs> So again, it, was, it wasn't because they were maybe angry at a particular situation or something drove them. It was just this general feeling that society had neglected them, wasn't respecting them, and so they lashed out, they misbehaved. And you'll see the same things happening in tech teams as well. Okay? People will just push straight to get to the Git repo, will push straight to master instead of having a pull request. You know? They'll start taking shortcuts with documentation, that sort of thing. So... Point number one, this is very, very important. Okay? In a lot of open source projects, they talk about the meritocracy, and they talk about how you have to come in and, and earn trust and earn respect. I say flip that on its head. Right? Assume that there is trust and respect to begin with, okay? and you're going to have a much, much healthier team to start off with. So people should be innocent until proven stupid. <laughs> <laughs> And you have to give people a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. Okay? I, s I always say there are no stupid questions. You don't do any, you know, when you do something wrong, it's not stupid until you've done the same thing the third time. Then I start revoking things like your commit privileges. My commit privileges have almost been revoked at my company. <laughs> I think I'm one away. Is Richard in the room? No, I can't see him. Good, good, good. It's lucky. Um, Another important thing about respect and trust uh, within a team is that people's performance and things like performance reviews are actually sort of concrete, measurable things. And um, if you look at some of the presen presentations on SlideShare by the folks at Google or Mozilla, uh, they go through some very practical steps of how you can, can do this, especially for engineers, right? Because engineers are on a, should be on a different track than the good old management track. Um, if you're a senior software engineer, your next automatic step should not be project manager, for crying out loud. You know, th there, is a, there is a separate track that people should go, go to. So we talk about respect and trust. The Belgians are going to love this. Are there any Dutch in the room? Yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll know all about this. We have the world's best football team, more or less, most of the time. And we are expected to win the World Cup more or less, or at least get into the final most of the time. Every year, at the quarter-final stage, the newspapers start writing the articles. There is a lack of respect in the dressing room. 
That guy who plays for that English club over there for 30 million euros a day, he doesn't respect his colleagues who play for the second division club back in Holland. And every single time, the Netherlands self-destructs at a major tournament because of a lack of trust and respect. And you can find this. Go back through all the newspaper clippings every two years, the Euros and the World Cup, and you'll see the same story again and again and again since about 1982 when we finally managed to win a European Cup. Yes. Number six, the six habits of highly effective teams. They share a common culture. This is a very unique uh, culture to the United Kingdom. Uh, does anyone here who's not from the United Kingdom, can they tell me what this is? Yes. Morris dances, exactly. Now, this is one of the weirdest cultures I have ever run across, and I've traveled to a lot of countries around the world, and the last place on earth I expected to see something which just made me scratch my head was good old England. I expected, you know, to meet the Queen, maybe, drink cups of tea, that sort of thing. But a bunch of grown middle-aged men dancing around with bells on their knees? What on earth is going on? Just bizarre. But they share this common culture. And it's amazingly popular in rural England, this uh, Morris dancing. They have competitions and fairs and goodness knows, I think, I think the, the sort of grand dance-off they have every year probably has more attendees than Devox. I still find it bizarre, but it's absolutely amazing because they have this common culture. So for me, uh, culture is uh, a common language of behavior. And I had the word acceptable in there before, but every time I come to DevOps after day one, I realize, no, I'm just going to take acceptable out of there. It just doesn't work. Um, one of the things I had a chat to uh, the CEO of Mozilla about was... Um, how it took him a long time to realize that culture was not the ping pong table that they had in the rec room. It wasn't the free coffee, it wasn't the bean bags, and it wasn't the going down to the pub every Friday night. A lot of teams think that's what culture means, and they sort of have these, uh, I guess, these rituals um, around that. And it's not necessarily a, a healthy culture. It's a very, uh, how would you put it? Uh, now I need to think of the Dutch word, and I can't think of it. It's a very, it's a very, it's on a surface culture. It's not a deep culture. It's almost like just skimming the top of what a good culture should be. Does anyone here have a company motto? No one's willing to admit it. Come on, if you're working for, where, who here works for Google? Come on, put your hand up, any Googlers? Do no evil? Yeah, company motto, is that really their culture? It's not, is it? It's not at all. So company mottos and all that sort of nonsense, not good for your culture, get rid of them. So effective teams, they work very hard at building a common culture together. It it's, has to be a very inclusive culture, and this is incredibly, incredibly hard to do with distributed teams and with teams that come from geographies that are very different to your own. Um, I will tell you a story in a little bit about how I screwed this up completely with a visiting team from Bangladesh. Uh, yeah, Al almost really, really set me back in my career, actually, so it will be a, a good lesson. Um, a common culture, a good culture, has these ideas of shared values. So... For example, if you've ever been in a technical team where you strongly believe in test-driven development, do I have people here who do that? Yeah? And have you ever worked in a team where everybody else just doesn't give a crap about that? How frickin' frustrating is that, right? It is so, so irritating, and you beg with them, you plead with them, you say, I will pair program with you, and they're like, you will do what? <laughs> Sit next to me while I type my precious code on my keyboard? How very dare you. That is a lack of respect and a lack of trust right there. <laughs> so it is very difficult um, when you don't have a shared value across a team. So I'm very blessed that with the company I run currently, J Clarity, we do have a shared culture of automated tests. Okay. I tried to start a shared culture of pure 
test-driven development, that didn't go down too well. <laughs> so I learned instead of trying to force that particular issue, well, can we at least be guided by tests? Can we at least have good test coverage? Can we at least have automated tests? Because we want to have a culture, a shared value of quality before we deliver to our customers. And that is something that our entire team agrees on extremely strongly, which is why you know a couple of my engineers right now are busy fixing a customer problem instead of sitting in a nice movie theater listening to an entertaining talk. So it doesn't necessarily have to be little specific things, but having shared values really, really helps. And the last point is it's very clear on how to have influence in your culture. Okay. If influence in your team is whoever is having the informal chat by the water cooler or downstairs with the smokers club, right, that is not a good common shared culture. Okay? You start again getting the them and us. Oh, all the decisions get made when Roy over there, sorry Roy, I have to point him out, goes downstairs with his other, other buddies from the management team, has a cigarette, and all of a sudden they came back, come back upstairs and you know the company's going in a new direction. That just doesn't work as a, as a common culture. So you may need to make sure that there's a very clear way that people can have influence inside the teams, whether that be done via a formal team meeting, feedback forms, uh, there's a whole bunch of online tools you can use for this now as well. One's called uh, 515, I think, which is what uh, the Mozilla guys currently use. So, to my story. So I was a young man in New Zealand. I had just graduated with both computer science and a business degree. And it was the start of the dot-com boom. And I thought I was going to be the next Steve Jobs. I'm definitely not the next Steve Jobs. I'm speaking here at DevOx. <laughs> so, quite early in my career, because I was, uh, I'd learnt Java at university, and the world was shifting quite quickly in New Zealand anyway to Java at the server side, some sort of web technology on the front. Um, they call it Ajax today, but that's a sort of JavaScript, HTML, CSS type of development they were starting to do then. So a very strange thing happened that a whole bunch of us who had only recently graduated became project managers or technical team leads of quite large development teams. Lots of responsibility, um, often dealing with developers and engineers who were probably twice our age, years more experience. Okay, so just a hand grenade waiting to go off, basically. Also, that was the start of the offshoring movement. So we started to offshore to teams in places like Bangladesh, Philippines, or to Australia. <laughs> I don't know why people always find that funny. So glad this is being recorded. Hi, Australian government. Um, so I, in my infinite wisdom, um, when the first offshoring, when we first started to do offshoring, I insisted, because I'd run some distributed open source teams, that, hey, we should do at least one face-to-face -face with these guys and get to know them. Okay. So we flew in this team from Bangladesh at great expense. And they were all very excited to come and meet us. Everybody thought it was a great idea. And my 23-year-old self went, you know what I should do to show them some good old Kiwi hospitality? Is take those vegetarian Muslims <laughs> to a pub serving alcohol on the barbecue day. <laughs> Children, do not try this at home. <laughs> Um, I like telling that story because uh, I got the sternest ticking off I'd had in my career to date. It was a real, a real wake-up call um, in terms of me trying to push my culture onto other people as opposed to trying to build a shared culture with the people coming into my team. It's a valuable lesson that I took away for the rest of my career. Something we do now at J Clarity and, uh, and other teams I've run before is we usually have a common culture around some sort of technology because it's definitely the one thing that everybody hopefully is still excited about. And I'm very pleased to see here at DevOps things like the Internet of Things, little hacker workshops and things happening because 
I don't know about you, but converting Java to XML to JSON to an Oracle form is just not all that exciting. Playing with robots and stuff, that's what I got into IT for. Awesome. So we have a shared Tech Friday where we uh, invite people from different companies in uh, on a Friday afternoon, and we'll just sit and have a, a general chat about some rough topic. We'll have an agenda like machine learning, for example, is what we did last Friday. So we invited uh, a couple of uh, people who just recently graduated in machine learning, and we came, sat in, and just had a, a great, fantastic rant and discussion about machine learning for three hours. It's this joy of technology, the joy of empirical science, um, which really binds our team together uh, in terms of J Clarity. And going back to my influence point, it's also that Tech Friday afternoon where we discuss a lot about the future direction of our products and things. So it's definitely a one sort of semi-formal place where everybody knows they can have influence in the company and, and going forwards. Right. Automation and tools. The humans have almost been replaced in this picture. There's still one left. <laughs> the robots haven't quite taken over yet. Um, I love automation to pieces. Um, I'm personally myself uh, not that great as at the hands-on work of doing Puppet and Chef and shell scripting and Linux and things. It's something I probably picked up a little bit too late in my career, and uh, I've never really sat down and be disciplined enough to learn it properly. But I love watching my team do it. <laughs> Talk, talking about micromanagers, terrible. So manual tasks suck, right? The amount of wasted time and effort that expensive, clever, creative engineers spend on manually deploying to QA or production, writing release notes in a Word document, um, doing some manual testing on a Friday afternoon with the whole company to see if the website still looks okay, so on and so forth, has just been an absolute bane of our industry. Um, being an engineer, being a programmer, you are one of the most creative people on the planet. Now, I know the outside world doesn't think this, but you're not only incredibly creative, you build and create things a lot faster than other traditional industries do. Again, in IT, you can do things like build a billion dollar company in two or three years, if you're very lucky. You can take down governments. All these sorts of amazing, powerful things that you guys can do. Yet your managers have you filling in timesheets. Have you filling in travel forms. They make you do expense claims on the two litres of petrol you use driving to work. They have you sitting in two-hour meetings. Who here has been in a two-hour meeting recently? Yes, good. Tell your managers they all suck. In fact, <laughs> in fact I'm going to walk right up to the camera right now. Managers, if you make your team sit in two hours meetings, you suck. Stop doing it. Thank you. <laughs> right, so we get these situations where people like Brian Gertz, this is not true by the way, I'm just using Brian as an example, I do not want Brian filling out timesheets. I want him finishing lambdas for Java 8 crying out loud. So, you know, need to sort it out. So, in your team, you need to go DevOps Pro. DevOps is a journey, by the way, not a destination. Uh, we've been on our journey for the past 18 months. Uh, we still lose from time to time when there's some strange new Linux configuration, uh, when Amazon decides to go down again, when GitHub decides to go down again, so on and so forth. It's definitely not easy, but it is so worth doing. J Clarity, our little tiny startup, We've delivered two products that we've got paying customers for in production based on you know a cloud-hosted SaaS service, blah, 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 all the buzzwords that you want. Two core engineers. That's it. The entire infrastructure for the company. Two core engineers. That's it. Now, when I've done this sort of work in traditional enterprise teams, that takes a team of 12 people. Because you need one Linux administrator. You need at least two DBAs, because they always come in pairs for some reason. <laughs> if someone can tell me after this talk why that is the case, I'd be really curious to know. I'm assuming it's the whole Sith Lord thing. You've got a master and an apprentice. That's my guess so far. If I get cut down by a red lightsaber on the way out, 
you'll know that's true. So anyway, in these traditional teams, people, are, people have been made so specialized and they still do things so manually that they sort of justify their existence pointlessly. It can all be replaced by automation. Yes, it's, it means that people will perhaps lose their jobs, etc. If they are any good, they'll either upskill themselves to, to do this sort of stuff, or they'll go find a bigger, more boring enterprise to go work in. So don't feel sad for them. Everything else? Does the laser pointer work? Yes, laser. Uh, thanks to David from Oracle, by the way, for allowing me to borrow uh, the clicker. Um, Rabia, actually, on year number three at DevOps, has finally cracked my code. I don't actually have my own clicker. Every year at DevOps, I put out the tweet in the morning, can I borrow someone's, please? And every year, DevOps delivers. It's fantastic. SaaS services. Do everything online with these new SaaS services. Expenses. Expensify. Sorting out how your team's going to do its daily tasks. Trello. How to do your travel. Trip it. Right? There is a million services out there that you and your team should be using. Do not manually fill in timesheets, etc. Okay? If your managers are making you do that, start pointing them at these services. They are so much faster and cheaper and easier to use. I once worked for a law firm. They <laughs> Has anyone here had to deal with lawyers? So I like my lawyers personally. Uh, my general counsel has uh, a suit which costs more than my team's monthly run rate. Uh, that means I've got a good lawyer, which is fantastic. It also means that he charges per six minutes. <laughs> no, seriously, lawyers do this. Just, just a lot of law companies will do this, charge every six minutes. Some uh, accounting companies do the same thing. And they make you manually fill out these timesheets when you go work for them. And every time I would fill out a timesheet, maybe six to 12 minutes of that one hour was spent filling out the timesheet. <laughs> so I'd have to account for that in the timesheet itself. It's just utterly mad and ridiculous. And the client would go, uh, six minutes at uh, 100 pounds per six minutes. Oh, I suppose you filling in a timesheet for six minutes was worth 100 pounds, so I'll just sign that off. Heck no, clients were furious, as you can understand. So it's just absolutely terrible. Talked about how we do automation J clarity already, so I'll skip that. Who here has had an argument with their spouse this morning for going to DevOps instead of going and in, going out there and doing some work? <laughs> um, so debating is, or arguing, as it were, and some teams like to call it. Um, it's an interesting point. Um, there are a lot of cultures in the world that um, don't like face-to-face -face conflict. Sometimes it's a geographical cultural thing. Uh, in a lot of uh, Asian cultures, for example, there's this concept of saving face. So within that culture, you do not confront problems face to face with a person head on. There's no shouting matches in public, that sort of thing. You never, um, you never talk down to somebody in public. You never tell somebody off in public, etc. Um, when you come from a place like New Zealand and you're Dutch born, <laughs> you get bluntness served up with a double dose of bluntness. And then you get sent off to work at a Japanese bank for three years. <laughs> and I kid you not, as a consultant on how to run their teams effectively. <laughs> so you can imagine what I did on day one. It's like, you're doing that wrong, that's crap, that's inefficient, don't do that. And I had my first written warning at the end of the first day. <laughs> it's quite good. They did keep me on though, um, which was very kind of them under the circumstances. Um, but debates um, has to be done in a way that fits in with the culture, but it is exceedingly important. And that is because assumptions are the mother of all fuck-ups. And you guys will have run across this time and time again in software development. Ah, uh, that'll be all right. There's no way a user will put a negative value into that form. <laughs> Check for the null pointer exception. That won't happen. The coder who's calling my method would never pass a null. Oh, yes, they would. <laughs> I'll do it deliberately. I'm just like that. So you've got to have debate in your team. It's incredibly important. But the bottom point there, debates lead to arguments, that can get a little bit unhealthy. Um, 
it's good to have passion, it's good to have pride in your work, um, but you do need to be very aware that you have to control debates, much like in a formal debating sense. You need to make sure that people are not attacking each other personally. Comments like, I think the code could be written in a better way, is okay. You're an idiot, your code sucks. Probably not so helpful. Um, we often uh, have debates uh, around our whiteboards over architecture, we'll quickly scribble up ideas. Um, things can get a little intense and heated in our team. Uh, we have people who are incredibly perform uh, passionate about performance tuning and about applying some of the machine learning stuff that we have. It's a pretty exciting field, so everyone's quite, quite excited about it and have got their own thoughts and have read their own research. So we make sure we take some mandatory breaks as well when we have our debates. So we encourage lots of debating in our team. In fact, whenever we start a new piece of work, if I see one of the guys like going straight to the keyboard to start bashing out technology, we sort of say, ah, stop. Let's actually discuss this up front first and have a debate, figure out a strategy that everybody roughly agrees on on how to move forward. Then you can go and start typing. Typing is the easy bit. But we make sure we have these breaks uh, if we have these long conversations. Every 15 minutes or so, we make sure we go out, get a coffee, talk about something else, <laughs> um, that sort of thing. Um, empirical evidence, trumping intuition, is, is very important when you're trying to have a good uh, debate. So I'll show you shortly um, Matt Rabel's technique for dealing with uh, making subjective technical choices. But as much as possible, you want your debates to be based on proper empirical science. Nothing is more infuriating than having someone say, oh yes, but I've had 15 years of Java experience, so I just know magically that my way is better. That really isn't good enough. And if you do that yourself, you really have to ask yourself, okay, I've built up these 15 years of experience, but what, what is it I'm really trying to say that this particular design pattern is correct in this particular case? That's the argument you should be using against the rest of your team, not the, I've had 15 years experience. I'm just going to skip Blackberry. The story there is just so, so sad. Basically, they didn't debate the fact that people didn't want to use physical clicky-clack keyboards on phones anymore. When the iPhone came out, from way on and high, and there was no debate on this whatsoever, don't worry, people will still want their clicky-clack keyboards. No, they don't. We can tell you no longer exist as a company. Sad. So uh, Matt Rabel, uh, did people catch his uh, session yesterday, I think it was, on Java or JVM Web Frameworks? Really good. I could see the Twitter, tw Twitter stream. He, he, he is absolutely brilliant. And he's the guy who taught me in my career on actually how to make uh, difficult technology choices quickly, um, especially when you're in a technical team lead role, an architect, a CTO, or you're just trying to convince your team that, yes, using Scala will be the, the future way forward. So he talks about having some sort of criteria that you set out for the technology you want to choose. And you want to pick uh, both functional and non-functional things when you're, when you're doing this. So uh, does this framework support internationalization? Are there lots of books written on it? Are there lots of people searching for this technology on the job market? Yeah. Is it easy to test? Is there a J unit runner for this thing? So on and so forth. You then go and add the weightings of what it is is most important to you and your company or your product, for example. So for us, we were choosing a NoSQL storage solution and we knew we had to have it, have it fault tolerant and distributed across the open internet. So the idea of replication for us was had a very high weighting and we weren't maybe as worried about the querying language for that SQL solution, for example. Everybody in the team then throws in their numbers in a big old spreadsheet. Yes, there is still some use for Microsoft Excel. You run the numbers and you just prototype the top two. You prototype the top two for about two to three days. And you make sure you pick the riskiest thing in your project to prototype on. If you can build that in two or three days or in a sprint, if people are scrum here, then you've probably picked a good technology. Now, it's still a subjective choice, but at least the whole team has ha sort of had their subjective say and things have been weighed up and measured. Here's an example, if we can see it. 
So here's Matt doing one uh, Java web framework. So this is quite some time ago now. But you can see here he's got um, Struts2. Love that framework. JSF. Really don't know why that's even on there. Um, so on and so forth. But you see he's got these 20 criteria on the left. Things like developer availability, quality of the documentation tutorials. Weighs them all up. And he used the top two at the time, Grails and or Rails and Gwit sort of came second equal there. Great way to quickly choose technology. Great way to structure your debates. So again, encourage debates, but encourage structure around your debates. And this is a really good technique to use. Diversity is the ninth aspect of highly effective teams. Technology should be outward looking. It should be forward moving. Okay? It should be an enabler. It should make people go better, faster, stronger, etc. But if you have a monoculture, if you, you and your team only believe your way is the only way, and you see anyone who writes their own Java logging framework, they're a team that does this, right? You have this monoculture, and that therefore delivers very poor technology choices and is very inefficient because they're constantly inward looking instead of outward looking, outward looking. Obligatory corporate marketing photo of a diverse team. Um, almost as good as a legal slide. I really need to stop ragging on other people. Um, right, so highly effective teams value diversity a lot. And what that means is don't just go and hire computer science graduates with a top grade from a top university. Monoculture, right? Don't all work in exactly the same way. Monoculture, right? Google and other companies, other tech companies, are actually very good at doing this. They have all these creative breakout rooms, bean bags, standing stations, sitting stations, work from the cafe, work from home, so on and so forth. Constantly brings in new ideas, new ways of thinking, fresh, fresh environments for people. Most importantly, and I think all developers will agree with me here, allow your teams to have 20% time. Yay, we love 20% time. Encourage them to have brown bag sessions. So encourage your team every week to bring a new technology at a lunchtime, introduce it to the team, take it through Matt Rabel's methodology as an example, and see as, ever, uh, and see as a team whether you can introduce more diverse ideas, new ways of thinking, and you'll end up building better technology choices, and your team will be more effective. Okay. If we'd chosen the traditional Java EE technology stack for our uh, product, we would have been so, so dead. I came from that world myself, though, and I think it's a great stack. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it for, for a lot of traditional request response web type use cases. But we're not. We're an asynchronous messaging type service which is scattered all over the internet. Okay? We had to come up with diverse technologies, di diverse ways of thinking. Another incredibly sad story. Another company that wasn't diverse enough and therefore just fell to pieces. The last bonus habit, technical debt. Who here believes they have technical debt in their project at the moment? Every single one of you. Who thinks it's their fault that they have technical debt in their project? At least you're being honest, that's good. Right. How many of you have got teams which have a policy on cleaning up technical debt regularly? Not too bad, actually. Decent handful. One of the worst anti-patterns I see in, in ineffective teams is the we'll clean up technical debt one week in a year pattern. Um, Netscape Navigator tried this, <laughs> and again, they're no longer with us. So you've really got to be tough on yourselves. And when I mean yourselves, not your team members, yourself. Okay? When you do something and in your brain you're going, ooh, I bet you if I was pairing with someone, they would probably go, like the mechanic does when he sees your engine, um, don't do that. <laughs> so that's the last of my 10 uh, effective habits. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed it and had something to take away. And uh, if there are any questions, I will take them now. One up there. Concerning debate, it could be a problem if you have some decision made already and they are questioned all the time and you can't move ahead at all. You lost your team. Okay, so the question was, or the comment was, that sometimes with debates, that when a decision has been made, 
and your team comes back and starts arguing about it again, that the whole team just stops. What you need to do in that case, or what I do in that case, is I take the team away from the environment they're in. So if we're currently in our office, we'll go to the cafe. We'll re-go over the original debate and the original subjective numbers we put down for the technology choice or whatever else we were debating. And we'll say, well, what has so strongly made you change your mind this time around? Was it because you just have finished delivering the prototype and you've realized that on the very last minute of the prototype that the technology was a bad idea, MongoDB? Yeah, yeah, we got caught out by MongoDB. If you want to hear more about the MongoDB story, I've got a talk tonight with uh, Richard at 5.50 called The Bleeding Edge. Um, we're going to tell you the truth about Mongo, and it ain't pretty. Um, uh, any other questions? Uh, in the middle there, yes, hello. Yep, no, I understand. So uh, the gentleman there was saying sometimes it can be very, very difficult to uh, write down or to explain what your intuition or what your experience is. And I agree, it's not the easiest thing to do in the world to begin with. Um, but the more you do it, it's like practicing anything. It's practicing technical communication is what I call it. So doing things like sketching it out on a whiteboard, especially if it's some sort of architecture diagram, whether it be class, network, uh, hardware, whatever it might be, that to me always helps because I'm quite a visual person. Um, Dan North, has people heard of Dan North? He speaks a lot on agile topics. He's got a yellow duck that he talks to on his desk. I kid you not, because he often doesn't get to pair with people, so he pairs with his duck. <laughs> so he'll sit there and talk to his duck, and then halfway to talking to his duck, he goes, oh, you know what, I'm wrong. So that's another way. By him verbally expressing his ideas, his duck tells him, not that he's going crazy or anything, but uh, yeah. All right, with only one minute left, I'm going to just wrap this up while people are leaving the room. Uh, thanks again for listening, and have a great rest of the conference.